informally call our meeting for our work session to order. And we do not have a quorum, but we don't need one for a work session. So what I will say is I was going to have a presentation that was associated with SFM. Apparently all their folks have gotten COVID. So we're going to delay that one. We're going to delay that one to the next board meeting. So what we have now is a presentation by Allison Bueller. She was the White House project for the operations at JLT uh, Center. So she is going to make a presentation to us and Allison, you know, do you have Dr. Mueller or do you have Paul? Well, I'm actually going to let the ladies that are in charge do that. Okay. I just support and try to get community support for the center. They do all the work and it is doing really good things. And okay. it's in a part of town that um, I know is on everybody's screen right now. You know, you hear negative things, but you don't hear all the positive things. And I'm going to let them tell you about that today. So I'll let Ms. Margaret start. We've been doing the youth program successfully for quite some time and then I'll let Rudy take over and tell you what we're moving into. Okay. All right. Okay. Good morning, Lord. Good morning. I'm just going to start out. Uh, I'm Youth Development Coordinator at the J.O. King Center and that Youth you, Development Program is doing way, wonderful. Turn around for you. There we go. Thank you, ma'am. The program is doing wonderful. I have a uh, a sta uh, the, uh, about 45 kids uh, daily. The number were bigger before, uh, no thanks to COVID, you know, before COVID hit, I had a, a number of about 85. But my after school program is going well. I've just uh, took in about four more new applications with students coming into the program from two to five in the afternoon. Um, my objective there is I have, uh, educated tutors, work study, and volunteers that come in, and also along with Ms. Angel Kirsten, who uh, does GED with EMCC, but come back to my program, and we do enrichment with our kids, and this is by me keeping up with grade, state test, and uh, progress report. So we try to target our kids' weakness and also strength. So we try to build both. Uh, we don't just stop at weakness. We also try to keep building on the things where they are strong at also. So along with this Angel Christian, um, my enrichment teacher, uh, and along with my educated uh, tutors and certified tutors and, and um, volunteers, our kids have powered up from August to December. We had a big number and a great show out on the progress reports that we got yesterday. And we're just going to continue to uh, enrich the kids. And um, where we lost a whole lot with the shutdown of the school year. But that's where we came back in at and tried to build up and, and, and uh, get them back up to where the level, you know, they're supposed to be even higher than the level they're supposed to be. Uh, also, uh, after studying, I know kids are tired by the time they get there at 2 33 o'clock. But also, after all the studying, they have a Vitamin D, God given outside, and then also I feed them before they go home so mama won't have to worry about homework is not being done and uh, have to cook, hurry to cook a hot meal when she get home because I make sure nutritionally through Southern Foundation and uh, the Mississippi Food Network backpack, they have eaten something healthy and can hold off a few hours and mama won't have to rush to shouting spelling words out, helping with math, math problems and, you know, just different things that she can relax from after she's had a hard day at work. And also uh, with my uh, career center, the, uh, we were down in numbers, but that's picked back up. We came out with a boom when we went back in January. Uh, now my career center has picked back up where we have monies for GED, monies for work keys test, and um, uh, okay, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We said, shut up, you, you on my part. Do your part. <laughs> but, anyway, but anyway, the career center numbers have picked back up, and also with a little funding also to help uh, residents with other things. I'm going to let off on that. But anyway, just want you to know my numbers is good. My kids' uh, work in school has picked back up from the drop, from the shutdown of COVID. And... Um, I'm getting in, uh, you know, like I said, just great, great teachers also along with MSU uh, uh, doctrines in, in education. They're sending over, you know, uh, great um, certified tutors 
and everything to help keep us there at that number. So we have powered up. We have powered up, and I think that program is so important, so important. So many families, so many parents thank me. Uh, so many parents couldn't afford to pay for an after-school program. We're free, but we do quality work. Well, let me ask you a question. You said you had a pre-COVID, you had about 80 plus, and then- Before, yes ma'am. Have yes, you identified the ones that left to try to get them back? Well, I have, and, some, and, and within that, some families have moved. Okay. Some have moved. I mean, even, I mean, moved out of state to other places. Some, some, some have came back. And like I said, I still, uh, I've taken in about five brand new applications. So, uh, and then I had some that, that were out when we first started back in January, uh, just due to uh, maybe contact tracing with uh, the Omicron variant. But they loaded, come back in, you know. So they're gradually coming back in from being, uh, you know, staying away and doing the five days stay away from people at home. Uh, I'm looking forward to an even bigger number before May. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any questions? Do you please ask? Because, because she's going to do that one. Okay. You got the power. Yes. She's okay. Got the power. Well, in that case, yes. Yes, ma'am. Any Thank questions? So any questions? I'm taking questions, ma'am. Oh. Screw. All right. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. All right. Oh. Appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Do y'all have? Is this the a quick, a quick one? <clears throat> Desert? All right, desert. All right, so I'm Rudy Rudd, as it states there. Um, I am the newest, I suppose, employee at the JL King Center. I started working there back in September um, while I was pregnant. I had a baby in November, and now I'm back. So I'm uh, glad to be back. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to do a quick, really, overview, kind of skip past kind of what Ms. Margaret said. She did a great job on her program. JL King Center has been around in Starkville for a very long time. Started by the late Reverend JL King. One of the biggest, I don't say biggest, our mission in general is to provide long term resources for people in the Starkville community. There's so much going on in Starkville that provides immediate needs to the people in Starkville. Those things include like Starkville Strong or other um, organizations that if something occurs, people respond. The purpose of the JL King Center, our mission, is to provide resources that not only help immediately, but are long term, so that you're provided with the skills and knowledge to continuously improve yourself versus only working with your issue that is current. Um, through that, we have several programs. Uh, one of them being the Youth Development Program that Ms. Margaret spoke on. It's pre-K to eighth grade. Uh, Ms., excuse me, Ms. Dr. Bueller had stated some of our kids age out to their program. Uh, so it only goes to eighth grade this Monday through Thursday it's after school. We have a GED and work keys program that recently we are reinstituting due to a grant. Um, this is a recent photo. This is not an old photo. Uh, <laughs> yep. Ms. Margaret there working with a student that came in and started doing the GED practice test. Um, so we have a program in place that if they go come up to the center and they complete the GED practice um, and really work hard and get all that done while we pay. Um, through the money that we've received for them to take the GED. And this is a very bright young man right there. Mm -hmm. um, our newest center, which includes the Career Center, as Ms. Margaret State, is the Career and Finance Center, where we have several programs, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, that's more geared towards adults. So each program at the JL King Center is geared towards a age group. So mm -hmm. our youth development is our youth, <laughs> as it states. Um, then our Leadership Academy is that tween to almost young adult age, ages 14 to 17. I'm currently working with the school district. I actually was up at Armstrong Junior High School the other day, uh, speaking with the eighth grade assistant principal about any recommendations on students we can get into that program. We let them know that public school is a public service, um, but they do things eight to three. They do the best that they can during the time frame that they have. Um, but you can do a whole lot from eight to three, but when kids go home, all of that stuff can go out the window depending on their home situation. So mm -hmm. as a community resource, we want to be that additional after school assistant. So during school you do that, that extends the positive impact that kids receive each day from 8 to 3 to 8 to 6, 8 to 7 o'clock. Um, so that the majority of their day they're being continuously fed um, positive feedback, 
skills that will truly help them with, come on, Rudy. It's a anger management. There we go with anger management, uh, organizational skills, et cetera, so that that time frame there at home um, is not as large chunks so that when they go back to school the next day, it's reprogramming, reteaching all over again. So our youth development program, I'm going to shoot right past that. Ms. Margaret did a great <laughs> job. <laughs> she did this, like, some of the things that we are doing. Uh, her summer camp is magnificent. Wow. Cooking classes, art classes, academic challenges. I could, we could speak all day on the after school program. It's, 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 she's done a glorious job um, over there. <clears throat> our, our GED. Can I ask about cooking classes? Is that for, for kids? Yes. So we had, okay. we had, okay. it was great. I mean, it was healthy. What was, who, who ran that, Ms. Margaret? Yeah, the nutrition department. At Mississippi State. Mississippi State. Yes, and the kids were cooking it up. Okay. <laughs> and chopping, but supervised chopping. <laughs> All right, so then the GED work keys, I have, that is brand new. Um, I really think that I mean, it's an excellent resource. Unfortunately, you know, things happen. Kids uh, have to take the GED. It's extremely difficult. You know, in a sense, it's more, it makes more sense to stay in school and try to push it out versus take the GED because it's very difficult. But we want to be, um, again, that resource to help kids uh, get their education however it needs to be. Um, received. All right, so our Career and Finance Center. So Employable U, so it used to be the Career Center. Um, so Employable U here on the top right is uh, one of our newest programs where basically you can come into the Career Center, we can help you find a job or we can help work with you in your current job uh, position. <clears throat> what makes this aligned with our mission is that its purpose is not just find you any job um, out there. It's to find you a job that's sustainable and meets your current needs. Um, we really want to help community members find jobs that at least pay $9, $9.30 an hour at least, because that, that right there will ensure they're out of the, off, above the poverty line. Um, anything below that, you're picking up another job, et cetera. It's hard to meet your needs. So we want to help them find those jobs as well as keep those jobs. So it's not just coming in filling out a job application, et cetera. We help them clean up their social media, create LinkedIn, do professional photo for their LinkedIn account, find that job, and then understand how to keep it. So workplace behavior, um, skills, because some people, I know for a fact my brother, he can find a job any day. Literally, I think he quits a job every two, two months. Um, it's like, how do you, some people can't find a job, you know, in a year, and he can literally pick up one and get rid of it. Um, but it's keeping a job. <laughs> That's also a skill within itself. Mm -hmm. So we also want to provide that resource. Financially Fit is our newest program sponsored by Regions Bank. Right? <laughs> yes, Regions. Um, again, long-term uh, goals here. It's not right now, mm -hmm. I need this. It's okay, you come in here, you're, you know, you're behind on rent. All right? Why? Why are you behind on rent? That's something is a skill that I received early in college. I was horrible at money management, but I didn't have those skills growing up. I didn't know that I found myself a spoiled brat. Um, so by the time I got to college, I was spin, 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 eat, 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 expensively eat. I was not a cheap eater. I, I ate a lot. Um, I can't remember the restaurant that used to be down here on Main Street. It was like Italian or something. Uh, Old Venice. Old Venice. I would get the calamari at least four times a week. I was. <laughs> I was living high on the hog, so, um, and so my money would go away, so then I'd go to church and ask questions, and then a family, they took me in, but they sat me down, they helped me learn how to manage my money. Mm -hmm. They're like, we're not just going to let you stay with us, this is what you're going to learn. Um, so that financially fit helps, um, assesses them financially, and at the end of that program, on our, it's on our website, they are able to set goals um, towards their financial goals for themselves. And again, that's sponsored by our regions. And so these are some of the new things that we're moving forward um, and having really tangible skills to provide our communities with members with, as well as power up. You can come in and learn how to save money on your energy bill. All of these are recent photos. Employable you, someone that we help find a job, the financially fit, someone coming in and working with our newest VISTA worker, Shelton. Um, just a couple days, it was last week. <laughs> someone coming in and working on their uh, learning how to lower their electric bill. I remember the lady walking out, she's like, I'm about to go home and turn on these lights right now. <laughs> That's what she said. Um, so I actually gave us the first grant to get that started, but we've got continual and, money now. And, and, and all the money. And all the money. You guys yes. got that going last year, and it was um, so successful. So we found 
money this year to do it. So, sure. yes. And so if you come in and complete those programs, all three, um, then I contact the Starkville Electric or Ford County, mm -hmm. um, and they get a credit towards their, um, their bill. I'm going to pass around and feel free to just look. There's only a couple of those. Um, all of these things are part of our Helping Hands uh, program. These people were referred to us. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to leave that with whomever is available to make copies, because I want them in the hands of as many people as possible. Um, whether it's a church you go to or another organization you work with, there are people come in and they have a need. And whether it's they're like, oh, I can't pay my light bill or I can't do this, and you don't want to just hand that money out, please send them to us. Um, and we have a referral form there, as well as a little brochure that I'm passing around with all the details of the King Center um, on it. Oh, oh, what it stop you right there. Okay. We've had, we went, uh, our visit worker went around to every church in town before the holidays and gave those forms out. And so we're asking the churches not to just keep giving $25, $50. We're asking them, come and get them. We sign off after they've taken the class. Then we send them back. Now you get your $25. And now you have a skill that's not going to make your bill high the next one. Mm -hmm. So, and then if they stay and they take two more classes, we'll help them additionally. But we've got to get this to be part of our normal cycle in Starkville. That we're not just putting band-aids on. We're not just putting band-aids on. We're training people so they're not in the same boat next year. There we go. All right, and to wrap it up, how can you be, you know, a resource for us? What we are seeking one, like I said, passing that around. Um, our referral sheet for the Helping Hands program, which is all three of those programs, um, is helping us get the word out. Again, Jail King Center has been here a very long time. Um, and I honestly think it's a staple in the community, but it's really getting people to know that we are here and we're not going anywhere um, and that we have these resources. And so also on the brochure for the Career Center that's going around, I have our Facebook, our Twitter, and our Instagram on there. So if you can, follow us, a like, a comment, or share is free. I tell it to people all the time. Um, it's as it's, it's simple as that. Uh, so. It, that's all I got. It, and the no, oh, last go thing is uh, the reason that we know we're there. This this place was funded through school district grants for years, 20 years. They would get a grant, they would lose it. They would open, they would close. They would open, they would close. And people never knew what it was doing. We're privately funded now, and I prefer it that way. Mm -hmm. That also means that we have Lighthouse par um, Partners, and Mayor Sproul was one of our very first. Mm -hmm. It's people investing in the center because it matters, and it matters in this part of town, and it matters for the whole community. So if the whole community isn't doing well, it doesn't matter. If your little neighborhood's fine, but this neighborhood isn't, it's going to bleed over. It's going to bleed over into our schools, into everywhere. So it's worth investing in. And if you are not a Lighthouse partner yet, it's $1,000 a year, or you can split it with another family, do 500 a year. And uh, we run this entire center on 80000 a year. I don't think there's anybody that does more with 80000 than we do in town. So thank you. Who, where else do you get funding uh, besides private donations? Do you have like the regions? Regions gave us. We'll get funding for, for programs. So like okay. regions gave us five thousand to run to that, to program. that program. Okay. We'll have Miss um, Margaret find people all the time that'll say, okay, we'll pay for GEDs, but no salaries and salaries are what we need, and we can't run these programs at all if we don't have good people doing them. And so about eighty thousand pays for everything, insurance. You know, we've got a really good active board, but it's, um, it's salaries and then the very few things that we buy. We, we, if we can get it donated, we get it donated. We don't spend it. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So thank y'all for the job. Y'all do a great thank job. Y'all keep a crowd. So. I've, I've been the president a lot, so thank y'all so much. Uh, on the road. How many folks uh, you serve in the when we talk about kids and adults? Numbers wise, do you, do you know you back that at all? Well, yes. all for, um, well, she, she's got 45. She'll, she'll graduate 45. In the summer, we might have up to 50 kids, 60 kids, oh, and um, we can kind of cap it. She doesn't want to cap it. I tell her, I don't. Uh, at about 60, because, you know, you want to give them attention, and it's just, I don't know how she does it. I don't. But then, our goal for, for regions, in order to um, get the grant again, we're going to need to, to run 50 people through that program, 50 families through those three courses. Last year, when you guys did that, we ran 90 people through that in the spring. Mm -hmm. And so that's 90 families that were impacted by that. It's, we could, we're capped by money, not so much by participation. Mm -hmm. The thing that really slowed down since COVID was jobs. So we used to have people in there all the time writing resumes, looking on the computers for jobs. That disappeared. When, when all the you know, bailout money came, 
nobody was looking for a job. But these little incentives are changing that. And so that's what's really exciting to see. Finally, we've gotten people back in in January. I mean, it's been a ghost town. And we're finally getting people back in with those little incentives. Okay, we'll help you with your bill, but now you need to look. You may have a job. Most of our people have some kind of job. But do you want an $8 an hour job, or how about a $12 an hour job? Let's see if we can't lose you. So, meeting with, you know, in my capacity at the East Center, but I think we have some, some synergy on some programs. Uh, John, I think Absolutely, yeah. So to, I guess, broaden that, in general, depending on the programs that we're running, we do get people in. Back in November, we had a series that we put on uh, partnering with Canopy Solutions. Um, I think we went in between 13 to 16 people. Um, Chick-fil-A and Array was provided free lunch. Um, that was, you know, how to treat anxiety, time management, et cetera, during the holidays. So if we have a program, we publicize that people, we do get people in on the adult side of things. And that's something that I'll be working with this spring, too, is, again, doing more programs, more community events to show, showcase the King Center. I'm thinking of doing a shark tank where they propose a business they could work in the summer, a like long loan, and we would buy the long loans for them to take them through the process of what it takes to start a business. Yeah, and entrepreneurship is something that we've been yeah. wanting to look well, into. Yeah. Sounds good. Great. All right. Thank all right. you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, we can move into our into our agenda. And we have two sets of minutes that uh, Mr. Blattermer says is good to go. Yes, ma'am. All right. So we, we can sit for those two. This is November the 30th, special call, and then the special call of December the 1st. So. Um, I don't have anything at this point in time. I think we have some introductions. We're going to be getting back to bringing folks in so that we can introduce them to the board, which is a practice we had dropped, obviously, during the uh, COVID time. But I think we've got some introductions that will be coming in. And Lisa, you nodded yes. Do we have that list yet? Uh, I've been given four okay. that, right. that are filling out forms right okay. now. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, no public appearances this time. We do have a public, public hearing. The uh, Smart Transportation, Alderman, former Alderman Dumas, comes to us every year to um, provide that public hearing that they have to have to check that box, and then he makes a presentation. That is also in your uh, in your e packet. It should be in your packet. You that you got? Did that print out, Lisa? Is that printed out as well? It is, and okay, I'm sending so it to should you. be in the printed packet, and it's also in the in the e packet that's available online. Um, and then we have a third public hearing. This one's going to require a little explanation, and Chris will weigh in with me on this. Uh, the rental housing ordinance, we're going to have a third public hearing, but it will not be under consideration at this point in time because a lawsuit that was filed against the city of Starkville, interestingly enough, got decided on, uh, it was Wednesday, I believe. And so um, in that, it was cited a case that became relevant to this rental housing ordinance. And so in the, in the effort to try to make it, if we're going to do this ordinance, we need to make it so that it complies with the latest case law. And so we pulled it from consideration and are just having a third public hearing because we had slated it for a third public hearing. And it goes along with the UDC, which we are having a third public hearing on, and then consideration of amending the UDC, which is not going to include that rental housing ordinance. Mr. Latimer, do you want to add anything in particular about that? No, I think you said it well. The, the, the case that we're looking at heavily, as you mentioned, is the uh, City of Madison case called Crook, Crook versus City of Madison in 2015. And we just want to make sure that the Rental Housing Code comports with not only that case, but other cases cited in that case that we're touching all bases on that. Well, maybe we're going to have a third public hearing. Now, shouldn't we have some type of draft of what our proposed amended um, ordinance would be? Yeah, they gonna ask did we not did we not include that? At least is that not in the paperwork that's yes. there? Daniel Haviland gave me an um Yeah, it should be. We'll have something to, to yeah. for our purview before the meeting that, that yeah. people would begin to should be in your packet. Okay. Um and, and we did do a third draft. We also had a meeting with um Alderman Brooks and the planning and zoning, Alderman Duman. I think you want to go to Alderman Dumas. A long time. Um, Jeremiah put together, the PNC uh, chair put together a meeting, and so we sat down with some folks uh, who were impacted by that. So we had a nice, a nice roundtable talk about that, and part of that draft will reflect some of those, some of those changes. But this, this, this thing we're going to have will reflect the, the, the Madison case and the amendments. No, 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 the draft, no, the draft. Not. I'm, I'm sorry, you go ahead, Mayor. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. That's the reason we're not having. We haven't made those changes yet. We're still trying to assess whether or not that, uh, how that will impact this draft. 
And so this is the draft that would, would have been put forward, but for <laughs> this case that came out on Tuesday. So how many public hearings, in addition to this one, we have concerned this after we get, say, a, a draft or something that we think is going to be? Well, it's going to, it's going to depend on how much the change is. I would say we will have at least one more, if not two more. It's up, the, it's up to you. It's discretionary. It's nature of change. Yeah. Oh. Um, all right. I just got it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, at this point, we're still in the in the fleshing it out mode. And I'll be perfectly frank. I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, to me, guys, the reason to do this ordinance was for us to be able to get our foot in the door before these um, uh, residences, these complexes, these houses became a problem. And so right now, the legal standard that has been articulated kind of guts the whole purpose of the ordinance because it says that you've got to have probable cause. Now, I've asked Chris to look and see in depth what probable cause translates to. There are three, three elements to it that were articulated in this case. One of them was general circumstances or surrounding circumstances. Another one was age or passage of time. And another one was uh, the type of unit or residence, whether it was multifamily or whatever. And so, you know, if if we get to the point that all we're doing is papering something that we're doing already anyway, I don't see a reason for us to develop something that we put on the books that is not necessary based on the fact that we can't get in ahead of it. We can't we can't say that we're going to go in just because we've got an agreement with, you know. 100 landlords that say we can go in because that's not that's not legal based on the fourth and 14th um the fourth amendment and the 14th amendment you're talking about code going in and doing a inspection well the question up I'm, I'm what i'm talking about is us us by virtue of this rental ordinance saying to landlords and property owners you sign this you register your your um housing unit and with that we have the right to then go in and inspect with reasonable notice, but that doesn't speak to probable cause. And so, you know, from that perspective, that's the reason Chris is going to try to flesh it out, see if there are other elements of, of probable cause or other ways to, to do this. But, you know, it concerns me that we would put an ordinance on the books that we don't need if this is something we're already doing. One thing so I, I, I guess complaint I've heard is, and this is just thinking out loud, is that our police officers are now, I mean, our code enforcement are now deputized police officers, correct? So yes. From a privacy standpoint, personal space, I mean, that's kind of what I do for a living, too, is, is you're going in there unannounced. Is that, is no, that? No, no, we're not going in anywhere unannounced. Well, I guess I'd say you, some of these situations, you may have four bedrooms with a central area, and you go in there and, and drugs are on the table or something. Is that code enforcement now? Do they have the authority to contact another officer who can come in there without a search warrant and basically search those premises? You know, they are, they are a law enforcement officer. And, so and it may not be that we consider personal space. If I come into your unit, I don't go into your bedroom, but there are general common areas. So if there's marijuana on the table, which could happen all the time, you know, is that, that is a, that's a law enforcement officer that's in there without a, without a search warrant. And so they can make that call to, to a, you know, a unilateral, another officer and say, hey, you know, I found this. This is what I see every day, all day, you know. Yeah. So. And that's one of the reasons we put the brakes on the draft being considered on Tuesday night, because I think you're exactly right. There's litigation going on all over the country on that specific point. Alderman Carver, and some cases are cutting this way, and the other cases are cutting that way. I talked to Daniel Haviland about it, and he's looking at them, and I'm looking at them because we want to synth synthesize them. And the cases that are holding up, we want to craft our ordinance if it goes forward to align with those cases. Just to tag one thing the mayor said, you know, the initial case she mentioned regarding the city of Starville was not a rental housing code case. You're talking about a Cleason's case. Yeah, it just cited a rental housing code issue. But when I saw that, I said, well, we need to apply that to what we've got going right now. So that set us down this path to, you know, pause, make sure we get it right before we enact it. I guess I was saying as a personal pay, a personal space, and the landlord's given the approval, but uh, that individual doesn't know that an officer's coming in that house. Well, and that's going to be between the landlord and the individual, because the landlord being, you know, if, me, you know, if I know somebody's coming in, I'm going to tell my tenant that somebody's going to be coming in and inspecting that, and, and I would certainly, I would make my lease make sure that I have the ability to do that. Well, see, I want to see I see that in about 50 percent. You you probably do that, and then some do, and some don't, because they want me to come in and, and if I see anything that's uh, endangerment to a child, um, drugs, anything, pet. A lot of times it's pets. You know, we, this is no pet policy, and let us know if you see something. 
So they want that option to come in there and, and, and for a code enforcement officer to say what they saw. So does a code enforcement officer have arrest powers if they see a pound of marijuana sitting on the table? I'm asking that question. Yes, I'm sure they do. Wouldn't that make any difference if those people were in the code department or the police department? I think the key, guys, is, is the probable cause aspect of this. Here's what we know from the City of Madison opinion, that the City of Madison tried to do advanced consent for these searches. In other words, in order to get a license and permit to have a rental property in the City of Madison, you had to sign off on advanced consent that somebody could come in and search any time they wanted to. The court threw that out because it didn't meet the probable cause standard. And so what, what's clear is if there is probable cause to go in a building, and then if an officer goes in probable cause and see, see something in plain view, then my best judgment would be that would be fair game for that officer to act based on what he or she sees in plain view. But getting in there is the key based on probable is cause. Is that going to blow the hole in, in all these places like Tebow and Art and these forces in place? I mean, they've got one where they do a semi or a buying or whatever. And I think it does, but they've got to have somebody who fights it. Uh, and, and that's they the do key. It it's right, massive, right now, massive, they Madison was doing that. Yeah, and Madison had this gentleman named Crook who fought their uh, ordinance and he won, basically. And so they modified their ordinance to reflect that particular element of what was found to be unconstitutional. How would this vary from if somebody applies for a bid for a privilege like a city star? First thing we do, we send a field inspector out. Right, Mark, you go in and inspect bid bid's premises. Yes, sir. And it's got to be full full effort. Well, first, first, at least a, a privilege license in City Hall, they got, that's got to be signed off on, right? Certificate of occupancy. So certificate of occupancy. How is that a certificate of occupancy for a, a retail business, a commercial business? Yeah, I know these are, these are, this is residential property, but, but we started this process to treat rental property owners like commercial businesses. Why, if, if they're in the commercial realm, why would this be, not be the same thing as somebody applying for a permit to be able to operate a business? I think it would turn on the reasonable, yeah, the reasonable expectation of privacy. When somebody just has a building that is up for structural inspection, oftentimes that has not been occupied yet and it's just there. There's nothing in there that would be found for an inspection. So you well, don't also have about the, You're inviting the public in, which is different than you're living there. That's an entirely different set of circumstances. So it's the privacy aspect of it. Okay. Anyway, that's a long way to go about trying to say that it's not all for, for consideration. So, so you mean, you mean the quiz in case it's going to ripple all through oh, the yeah. world. Yes. No doubt. At least for <laughs> us. <laughs> Un <laughs> unintended consequences. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, it's, I think it's really important. I'm probably going to lean against it. And, and the reason is from what I see on a daily basis. And, and that, I'm, not a, I'm not a commissioned law enforcement officer. Um, but that's a privacy thing. And I, I do think you're going to start seeing, you know, we'll, we'll, how, how far taft. We go from a complaint-driven type code enforcement where, you know, accessory structures or things, and, and I've been told that unless we get complaints, so this is a really big step forward going into somebody's personal space with behind that door as a tenant. Um, yeah, you're right, I've, I've got all types of different landlords. Some do give uh, do give that warning to that person that's fixing to come into their privacy space, private space, but some don't, and some just don't think about it and it happens, but that's a pretty big step to go behind somebody's closed doors and what you see back there and what kind of legal steps you're going to take with that. Um, well, we, don't, we do not go in uh, unannounced, absolutely. The city and right now, code enforcement is not simply complaint driven. That's part of why they're driving around and, and seeing things and responding to things and, and bringing things back to either Steen or, or whoever to move forward with something. So it's not just complaint driven. They are driving around and being proactive. But what you see on the next year with them won't necessarily show you, in, for instance, in the, in the Instances of Wilson Gardens, what's the interior condition of the building? I've been around for a year, and, 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 and if it, this wasn't complaint driven until it got to where the ceilings were falling in and people living over one corner of the room because there was water coming in on the other side. I mean, how, how do you strike? I mean, Councilor, how do you strike a balance between. Well, I mean, and the court speaks to that, that there's the, the probable call standard for administrative inspections is a lesser standard than the probable call standard for criminal activity. And the mayor said that they mentioned three factors. One, the passage of time between the last time the building was inspected and an upcoming inspection. So the longer the time, the more probable cause you have to get in there and check something out. The second thing would be the nature of the building. Is this a small building? Is it multiple stories? Could there be structural issues from a height standpoint? The bigger the building, the more dense the building, the more probable cause to get in there and check it out. 
The third factor the court looks at is the general surrounding area. If the general surrounding area is kept up nice, you know, the thought would be that that property probably aligns with that. Conversely, if the general area is a mess, you have more probable cause to get in there and look at it. So those are just three factors the Crook case mentions, and we're looking at other factors. We want to load up and put all those factors in our ordinance to make sure we track the case law. And Mark, once we inspect the building, this issue of a stupid ox, we don't go back, I mean, unless there's some reason that somebody says, hey, that building's gotten bad or something's wrong with the wire or something like that, we don't go back in. Once we've issued that stupid ox, that is good from, from then on, right? A lot of people pay that review no, we, we'll back. back. We go back and do fire inspections. You do? So commercial. You have a reason to go in there. For tonight. commercial properties. Yes, sir. And we do, uh, we do inspections for uh, the fire extinguishers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So, I mean, rental property, residential rental property is a business. I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it's it qualifies it. it. I mean, it is. It is. No. It, 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 it may fall when it crash when, you know, purely residential and purely commercial, but it's, it's a business. And I mean, do commercial rental property owners have, that have LLC corporations, stuff like that, or do they go through the, uh, they have privilege licenses, do they have Yes, absolutely. So, so somewhere on the front end, there's been some inspection. Of, of occupancy or something before they like it would or like a, a business downtown or something like that before they well I mean sign anytime off you, yeah I mean, anytime you built a built a unit but after that it becomes a periodic thing associated with like inspection fire, or something like that or, yeah, or inspection fire extinguishers and that sort of thing so right. anyway that's again you know, long long way to get around to we're not taking up the, the ordinance this time around but we are gonna we are going to uh, have a third public hearing um, next item is extending the proclamation for another 30 days, which goes along with the eighth resolution still being in place. So, consent for that one. Uh, this next one is, uh, as y'all recall back on uh, October the 21st, I think it was, we uh, agreed to do ARPA funds used for parks. Well, the final rule is now out, and there are there is a vast expansion of opportunities of using those ARPA funds for things. And so, as a part of that, I wanted to make sure we had the absolute maximum opportunity to get matching funds from the state legislature. And while they may they may love parks, they may not love parks, and they may love the the build grant, or they may love doing the Main Street project. But I just want to make sure that whatever we can get for matching funds, we've got the maximum flexibility to do so. So that's the reason that this is on here, is so that we can go when we go down to the legislature, which I'm supposed to do next week. That, you laughing at me? I'm laughing at Mike. Oh, you laughing at Mike? They, they whooped that to death in that section. They oh. beat that. Okay. They beat that down. Yeah. About what? Using ARPA funds for certain? Using ARPA funds. They want to knock on nobody, but they want to see them. Well, sure no, absolutely. Like but <laughs> but if you look at that final rule, it is very expansive in what it allows us to use. Yeah. But I want to make sure as we go forward that we have not boxed ourselves right. into a corner. Yeah. With the language that we used the last time we were right. Ain't nobody going to go to jail if we spend it improperly, just going to ask for a check. That's true. And we money. don't want to do that either. Okay. So. Well, we yesterday's we legislative uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Hoseman really uh, hit hard on infrastructure, matching funds for infrastructure. Right. Arthur never mentioned, so I think it's a really good idea to broaden this because uh, I, I feel like there'd be a whole lot more sentiment from, from that group for water sewer, paving roads, building roads, any of that sort of stuff. Right. And I've, I've spoken with uh, both Senator Williams and Representative Roberts. In fact, he was here earlier today talking about how we position ourselves to get uh, matching dollars as best we can up to the maximum, which right now is dollar for dollar. Yeah. But the legislature may be doing not just matching funds for ARPA, they're going to be doing appropriations and they may even be doing a bond bill. So there are opportunities um, all around for us to get some assistance with uh, several of our large projects. Have you had any conversations with anybody that those gentlemen or anybody else that they're not favoring parks match, match a dollar for dollar match with parks? No, I haven't. That that just is not the topic of discussion when they start discussing when they just didn't mention Hosman, it at all. Hosman in particular. Yeah. I think our argument is excellent. It's still within the, the uh, final rule. Uh, it still makes perfect sense. But if the legislature only wants us do X, then we can use that for 
the, that those projects and do other things for other projects. So. So you have until 2024 to allocate that offer fund. I mean, the y'all's motion with the parks, is that set in stone that it has to be used for parks, or can you back out at this that's, point? And, that's what this is about, that's, is to so give us some flexibility to change that if we want it's to. It's just basically adding the, the where it utilized, where you could do the Main Street project and the build could also be. Yes, and awesome. that's, that's the way this is written, so that it incorporates the maximum flexibility for use of so Nothing's been set in stone. So if parks wasn't set in stone, so we could still be arguing about this basically until the money's been spent right I mean we have until 2024 for final allocation of funds well what what this is about is trying to get matching funds from the state and that that ship is going to sail this legislative session I feel sure so whatever we do now is what we present to them and they will be doing something between now and April 1 so nothing's going to be set in stone as it relates to what how well they yes it will if we agree to do it then that's what we're going to be doing they mentioned 400 million dollars in funds available to match yeah. Now that that wasn't set in stone either. That's just a number he threw out. Yeah. So this is this is this is congressional money. This federal money come down to the states. The states the discretion on how to be spent. And they're talking about dollar for So we have to argue. Uh, it's local match. I know it can be. I mean, other than just cash or or a bond or some type of local revenue. I mean, you know, money put up dollar for dollar. I mean, it's really like in kind. What what when they say dollar for dollar match. What are they? are talking about the ARPA funds, and we have $6.2 million that we should have in the bank by the end of the And we can leverage that against more monies, which you're saying? Or With, from the state. From the state. Yeah, that's what uh, Lieutenant Governor Ho Hoseman has said, is that they're, now that, that speaks only to the Senate side. That doesn't speak to the House side, which they have their own set of priorities. But I feel sure somehow or another we're going to come together so that that dollar for dollar match has been out there enough that I think people are now having an expectation and the House will probably be compliant about that now what they're willing to say that we can use it for may be different than what Hoseman thinks is important but somehow or another I just want to make sure we have the absolute maximum flexibility to be able to participate in those funds that the state is going to share and and Alderman Beatty what the um what the state has in terms of their ARPA funds there's some that are designated for this that and the other but they can make sub grants of their ARPA funds and that's what they're would do with us if they match funds it's essentially a sub grant to us so and in the, in the speaker for instance he, he didn't quite go down the same path about dollar for dollar i mean i heard him throw out 80 20 but i, mean, I think there's a lot it's of it's interesting because he was dollar for dollar when he was in the county courthouse uh, he, he said the speaker which would have been good yeah, oh you said speaker i'm sorry i apologize i heard what well, he did uh, lieutenant governor Hosman. no no so all the courts um y'all saying that thing did um it looked like that, that there was going to be a lot of emphasis on, on the cities having put this first round of money in or allocated it toward infrastructure or a, a fine, in final analysis that the infrastructure on the front initial money was going to have to have been our money be used for infrastructure to get the second round of money or you just think it's just going to be a bad side of it or what do y'all well, think? Well, that's my opinion that all the ball can, can weigh in. But, I mean, they mentioned the stuff that we, we've heard so much, broadband, water, sewer, uh, streets, pavement streets, and even building roads. That's what they mentioned. You know, they didn't mention some of the other stuff we talked about, such as parks. But, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I, I certainly wouldn't say that parks wouldn't be it. I'm just saying that that's what they were mentioning, the stuff that makes everybody feel better, you know. But, but the easy uh, button. Yeah. Uh, but, but so, so this access road from the extension care road on Highway 25, that potentially would, would be a project you could use it. Uh, well potentially although I think they're probably more inclined to go with shovel shovel ready kinds of things. We we're, we're a long way. Yeah we're we're a long way. Yeah and they did they, they did ready sound ready like you know, have your stuff ready and get it get it to us because uh, I mean it, it's a lot of money but it's not unlimited. Again I heard the four million thrown out time or two. Well they've got one point eight billion they've got to figure out what to do with this. Broadband number one that talked about broadband one more thing on, on, on the field uh, grant on the Highway 22 project. We are going to place some water line. Yes. Thing. And that's, a, is that it? that's our super here. storm water. Mm -hmm. Yes. But we also are $3 million over our initial $3 million required. Sure that's plugging that into the project. And so that's part of the reason that that is also in this language of this particular agenda item that I put together is the Main Street Bill Grant and other infrastructure project so we've got absolute maximum flexibility okay. all right thank you anybody want to do consent on that we'll talk that some more <laughs> i'm good with consent okay all right let's go there let's see
Um, then we moved down to engineering. This is a change order. Neither of these change orders, and, and Edward is on the, on the Zoom call there, uh, neither of these change orders impact us in terms of financial impact. Is that correct, Edward? They're just time That's related. That's correct. It only adds calendar days. Time related. So. Have you all ridden through there and looked at the turf field yet or the parking lot? Yeah, oh, nice. Nice. Something nice. to be proud of, y'all. Yep. Excited about it. Uh, okay. Soccer person that slash football. Yeah. And we do consider on those since they're not they're not dollar related. All right, thank you. Uh, acceptance of the December financials usually is, is something we are willing to consider on. Um, under HR we have got we've got some hirings and which is wonderful because it's been hard to get hard to find people to come to work. So we've got uh, Ms. Lisa Lamasters is the new deputy clerk accounts receivable. And I believe uh, Ms. Harden is very excited about that consent for that one. Um, we've got full-time radio operator dispatcher and part-time radio operator dispatcher. I think the chief is pleased about that. Consent. <coughs> um, we have part-time receptionist at city clerk's office. Is this um, is this part of a grant or part of a... a no, she's been working for Project Peace okay. and then her hours have run out. But Miss Johnny Armstrong, that I think everybody's known for the last couple of years, had surgery in November and uh -huh. is not ready to come back. So Alex will fill so in until Miss Johnny comes okay. back. Consent for that one? Um, advertising for a custodian. Uh, Lisa, you want to share a little bit of that? Um, we've been working on this for about a year now. Uh, we have janitorial service contract here with City Hall. Uh, utilities has had a contract. Airport. Uh, has not had really anybody. They've been taking maybe some jail help or anything they could get. So the three departments have gone in together to look at hiring. Back, I think everybody remembers Mr. Bobby back in the day, and mm -hmm. then we had another one after that. So, Jay, Justin. 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 So we wanted to go back to a full time. <clears throat> We're having trouble with the companies getting quality care for the building, and we don't see these people that come in during the night and all, mm -hmm. so we have to leave notes here and there. but. We're, we're going to go back to trying a full-time custodian, right. and then we're, we've all agreed. We've gotten together and agreed to share the expense of, of the person to kick in what we've paid a contract company. To. So, yeah, I'm there. All right. so uh, you're just hiring. you're just shifting um, contractual services yes. for an employee. Yes, and we've had to buy the supplies and all for these companies anyway to have them ready um, here for them to use. So this this will just be a little bit more. We can leave a note and have an actual employee in the building. Someone that you can see. I'm all. <laughs> yes, and give them specific tasks face to face, which is really good. Right, right, right. Okay, all right, and we have a uh, James Smith as a new police officer, um, and I swore in two yesterday, which was wonderful. So consent for that one, and then Darian King as a new maintenance worker for sanitation and environmental services. And I know Chris is excited about that. Um, under the police department, we've got surplus for seven of our four Crown Victorias. Consent with that. Um, and then two Dodge Durangos purchasing, okay, consent for that. And then uh, listing 15 unmarked cars for fiscal year, and that's required by co statutory code, so consent for that. And under the sanitation department, we're purchasing a Kubota tractor. And, oh, the track is this the tractor with the boom arm? Where, yeah. There you are, okay, the tractor with the boom arm, which we need, because that other one is about 30 years old or something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and then consideration of purchasing a tire boom mower from Covington Sales. Consent for that one. And then 40 dumpsters as surplus. Yes. Hopefully those bring some change in. Uh, and Mr. Terry has authorization to declare the water division Chevy truck as surplus. We're cleaning stuff up, guys. And then other de uh, declare other machinery and generators as surplus. Um, and then we have one item for executive session, which is property acquisition, and that's related to the airport. So we'll be taking that up. And aside from that, that is the uh, sum total of our agenda for the day following the you know, MLK day. So everybody's got a long weekend. And we have, is it citywide pickup again? Make sure okay. question on something. That was a couple, but uh, it's going to be after Christmas, so we won't be here. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Is there anything you want to talk about before we go? All right, I appreciate it. We are. Thank you. Sure. Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you.